Good evening and welcome to the Ford Hall Forum. I'm Christopher Leiden from WGBH, survivor of the 10 o'clock news, host of Christopher Leiden and Company. I hope you caught our program Friday night in which John Updike read significant pieces of his famous essay on Ted Williams. If you didn't catch it, you should ask GBH to rebroadcast it. <laughs> My first obligation tonight is to tell David that you're in Shields country tonight, <laughs> at, least, at least geographically. I have several things to tell our audience. First, that we're thrilled that you're here. Also to tell you, uh, not too subtly, that both the Ford Hall Forum and WGBH are member organizations and they're very eager to enlist you as full members if you're not already. I also want to remind you that this lecture will be broadcast Monday night at 8 o'clock on WBUR. And also to tell you that the next Ford Hall Farm, four Sundays from today, will feature Nat Hentoff of the Village Voice, but Dorchester born and a great man. Also to tell you that uh, there will be a question and answer session with David Gergen after his talk. Now to introduce our guest. For years I thought of David Gergen as Mark Shields' straight man, but I also notice he he scores very respectably on his own these days in, in the McNeil Lara News Hour. They've been called the Burton Ernie of the McNeil Lara Hour. <laughs> Mark Shields is a Weymouth lad and a Notre Dame Democrat. David Gergen is a Yale Republican of the sort of post George Bush stripe. He is now the editor at large of US News and World Report, but he has also served in not only the Nixon administration, not only the Ford administration, he was, in addition to all that, the director of communications in the Reagan administration. He was, so to speak, the great communicator's great communicator, which is just to give you an idea of his stature, but also perhaps to give you fair warning about his political spin. It's a pleasure to introduce David Gergen. Thank you very much, Christopher. I'm glad to see you're still up to your old tricks. And uh, it's deli I'm delighted to be uh, introduced by Christopher. Actually, I had the pleasure of going to college with his uh, younger brother some years ago, so I've, I've, I've known many in the Leiden family here for a long, long time. <coughs> his other, oh, younger brother was more respectful, I might add. <coughs> I'm sorry that Mark can't be here uh, with me tonight, and uh, you know we're usually attached by the hip. <clears throat> but he gave me the day off for the Boston Marathon tomorrow, and I'm uh, delighted to join all of you. I was asked uh, by Wendy uh, to talk about Bill Clinton's first hundred days, and I, I confessed to a friend a little earlier uh, uh, today that I was having a very difficult time coming up with a theme uh, for that subject. I, I find his presidency a hard one to get a handle on. Uh, I think it's one still very much in formation, so it's, it's very, I think it's difficult and indeed presumptuous to make grand conclusions about it. I don't have sort of an overarching theme or subject. I was a little bit reminded in thinking about this, uh, about a preacher been in my home state of North Carolina. who was a Baptist preacher who was scheduled to give a talk to the Kiwanis Club about sex, uh, sex and marriage. As he was working on his talk the night before, his wife came over and asked him what he was going to talk about, and he was a little sheepish about it, didn't want to talk about it very much with her. And he said, oh, he was going to give a talk about the fine art of sailing. And she said, oh, that's very interesting. So she went about her way, and he went on and gave his talk. And two days later, she was walking down the street and met a couple of fellows from the Kiwanis Club. And they crossed the street and came over to her and said, you know, your husband gave a wonderful talk. And, and what did he talk about? Oh, oh no, she, he said, your husband gave a wonderful talk. And the woman said, I've been so perplexed about that, you know. This is not his favorite subject, you know. And they said, well, he was just terrific. He was very good on it. He, he really talked, uh, talked very knowledgeable. And she said, well, I'm very surprised. <laughs> <laughs> she said, the first time we tried it, he got seasick. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we tried it, his hat blew off. <clears throat> and we haven't tried it since. <clears throat> And I felt a little bit like that as I was searching for this theme about how to come up with something concrete about what's going on here in the Clinton administration. It is clear we have a new day. 
Many of my Republican friends are astonished at how rapidly the figures of the very recent past have uh, receded into memory so quickly. George Bush already seems very much like a, a man from the history books. You know, George Bush is like every other politician. He can't quite stop shaking hands. You still like to be loved out there. I'm told about a week ago he was, he was traveling around Houston, stopped in at a retirement home to see some, some folks and shake hands. And he went around, he met one older woman who seemed a little bit uh, puzzled by him. And she, he looked at her and said, uh, well, do you know who I am? And she said, no, but if you ask down at the front desk, maybe they can tell you. <clears throat> <clears throat> As, as I look back upon the Bush years, I, I must say that uh, it, it's very clear, of course, that the economic conditions swept him out of power. Uh, but I think the turning point, very interestingly, very strikingly, uh, came at a very odd moment. And the seeds of defeat, in my judgment, were planted at the moment of greatest triumph in his presidency, and that is uh, in the war against Saddam. I say that for a couple of reasons. For In the first place, uh, the war changed many Americans' opinions about who George Bush was. Until the war occurred, uh, Republican pollsters found last year in their focus groups, until the war occurred, many Americans uh, liked George Bush. They felt an affection for him. They adored Barbara Bush. And they did not hold George Bush responsible for the nation's problems because they thought that he did not have it within his power to change things. They did not think he was decisive. They did not think he was a strong leader. They thought he was rather ineffectual, and therefore they didn't blame him. They thought he was a little bit bumbling. And what they saw in the war as Clark Kent turned into Superman, was someone they didn't recognize at first, so that even as they applauded him for kicking Saddam out of Kuwait, and indeed I think he deserves a great deal of credit for that, they also came to believe that he's not the man we thought he was. He's, he has a lot of decisiveness when he wants to show it. He has strong leadership ab abilities when he calls upon them. And the fact that he is not attacking our domestic problems is not a suggestion that he's ineffectual, it is rather a message that he doesn't care. And for that, people bore a great deal of resentment. And the resentment turned into hostility, and it was something he couldn't overcome uh, during the campaign. The other thing that happened as a result of the war was that within the White House itself, and indeed within a lot of Republican ranks, there came to be a feeling that George Bush was unbeatable. That if he could beat, if he could kick Saddam out of Kuwait, he could knock any Democrat out of the ring who cared to step into it. There was an arrogance that crept into the White House, what the Greeks would call hubris. And I think it went all the way to the top. There was a refusal to face reality, particularly in California, where a state which was almost falling off a cliff. There was a sense that we don't want to take advice, we don't need your advice. Many, many Republicans tried to go in and, and, and offer help. They were rejected. And I think in the end, the arrogance brought them down. The story is told that after the election, John Sununu had a breakfast with Jim Baker and turned to him and said, Jim, I just don't understand why everybody in Washington took such an instant dislike to me. And Baker said, John, it's very simple. It saved everybody a heck of a lot of time. <coughs> and I think there's something to that. That arrogance cut deeply over time, and I think it, I think it upended the president. Now, I happen to believe, and I'm going to put this down, but I happen to believe that over the course of history, George Bush will be better, better remembered than he was remembered by the voters this past November. That he, I, do, I do think that he neglected our domestic needs. I think his administration will always uh, be indicted for that and will stand guilty, in my judgment, uh, for doing too little. But I do think that also his foreign policy accomplishments uh, will gain a little more stature as time goes on and will have a somewhat more balanced view. I happen to come from the school that believes that the defense buildup of the 1980s bore results, that it hastened the demise, the fall of the, of the Iron Curtain. Uh, I am of the belief that Star Wars will never know if it worked, would work militarily probably, but I think it worked wonders diplomatically. And so that I think that in the long run, that for whatever failings they may have had on the domestic side, that Reagan and Bush will get credit for their foreign policy and will take some, I think will get some credit if history is written fairly 
for what was accomplished on that front. It's odd that Reagan, who, who came in as a domestic president, I think his foreign policy was far more successful than his domestic policy. But the Reagan and Bush together will receive some credit for that. But be that as it might, we now have a new team in Washington. We have a new day. My pal Shields, and he's a wonderful partner. I, I, a man couldn't ask, I think, for a better partner than Mark Shields. He's, he's witty. He's warm. Uh, he's, he's extremely honest. He's very supportive. I, the only thing I can't get straight about him is why he has all those fine qualities and so is so consistently wrong. <laughs> but the, <clears throat> he likes to say that we now have a new, let, uh, new leader of the Western world, along with her very fine husband. <clears throat> And we're all trying to puzzle what this means. I will tell you about Bill Clinton. I've had, I don't know Bill Clinton as well as I've known some of our other recent presidents. I have had the opportunity to get to know the Clintons over the last uh, several years at a gathering that, uh, it's a social gathering mostly, that, that, that occurs over the New Year's period. That a number of families, mostly from the South, gather at a place called Hilton Head, South Carolina, uh, for three or four days together. And it's something I've been going to for, I guess, about a dozen years. And the Clintons started coming six or seven years ago. And I had the opportunity to get to know both of them uh, on many an evening there and to talk a lot. We talked an awful lot. One of the things I learned was that never speak, I, I shared a podium with him several times, and one of the things I learned was never speak after Clinton speaks in the evening. <clears throat> First place, you rarely, he's a terrific speaker. He is a wonderful, very difficult speaker. He's extemporaneously one of the best speakers I've ever heard in politics. But the other thing about it is by the time you get to the microphone, it's usually after midnight. <laughs> And by that time, he's hungry again. <clears throat> so he's a difficult act to follow. Uh, but what I will tell you this about him, because I do, while I disagree with some of his policies and some of the thrust of some of his policies, I've had the privilege of working with three of our recent presidents and knowing the others going stretching back over a quarter century. And I don't, I don't think there is anyone who has come to this office with a better grip, a better understanding of what's going on here in America than Bill Clinton. George Bush had the largest international Rolodex of anybody I've ever met. He, had an he has an army of friends around the world. Bill Clinton has an army of friends and acquaintances here in this country that he's developed over a long period of time. Richard Nixon, in my judgment, had the best strategic sense of international affairs of any of our presidents over the last quarter century or so. I think Clinton has the best strategic sense here at home of what he is looking for. I, don't, I think he's been, had a hard time expressing that. I think he's had a hard time finding his way in that sense. But I give him an awful lot of credit for, as someone who has studied hard. He's very bright. And he has thought, he has gotten his hands dirty with domestic affairs. Well, some of our recent presidents have not done that. They haven't been willing to get down. And he has worked with people out in the, uh, in, in the highways and byways. He knows what it means to be poor in this country. He has talked to people like that. I think he is particularly good. This is something I care about a great deal as a, as a son of the South. I think he's particularly good about race and race relations. I think he comes about it very honestly. He is a product in many ways of the 60s. The worst of the 60s and the best of the 60s. The worst of the 60s was, I think, probably the personal excesses. The fact that the, the sense that some of us grew up with, that anything goes, particularly in your private life, as long as you're accountable in your public life, uh, and, and you led a straight public life, your private life was sort of your own matter, matter. And I think a lot of people who came through that period, you know, explored, were quite liberal in that, and, and got into some things that they probably regret over time. And I think he was in part a product of that. But the best part of the 60s, and there was some good, very good things about the 60s, the best part of the 60s, in my judgment, uh, was the civil rights revolution that took place in this country. An unfinished revolution, a revolution on which we're going backwards at many times, it seems. But nonetheless, that many people who came through that experience, I think for many who grew up during that time, it was a formative period. It was a period in which you made commitments. And I think he made a deep commitment. And I think he's better than any president I can remember in the past 25 or 30 years on these questions of race and on class and issues like that. I think he is very inclusive on those issues. And for that, I think he deserves credit. So I think there's a lot of good things about Clinton. I think there's a lot of promise in Bill Clinton. I think Hillary Clinton brings a lot of strength to this relationship as well. You know, the story is told that uh, after the election, before they started getting into the limousine set, they were in one of our large cities and they were going across town to have dinner with the mayor. 
and they got into a cab and were driving across town and as soon as they got into the cab, Mrs. Clinton started talking to the cab driver and they talked nonstop all the way across town. It was jabber, jabber, jabber all the way across town. Got out of the cab and Bill Clinton looked at his wife and said, well, honey, did you know that fellow? And she said, yes, before I met you, uh, we actually hey, were, were involved. We were romantically uh, connected. And uh, President's shoulders went back and his chest went out and he looked at her and said, well, did it ever occur to you that if I hadn't come into your life, you might be married to a cab driver? And she said, well, no, that didn't really occur to me. What occurred to me if I, is, was that if you hadn't come into my life, he'd be the president. <laughs> <clears throat> And I think she brings that quality to this. I will tell you that he thinks a lot here. She's much more cerebral. She's right up here. She's very bright. If anything, I think she may be brighter than he is. You know that they, uh, she finished first at the Yale Law School class when he was finishing sixth. They said, uh, you, you know, during the campaign it was two for the price of one. You talked to some of their professors back there and said, that's not really true. It was about two and a half for the price of one. <laughs> She's the disciplined one. She's the one who keeps things moving. She keeps the focus. She moves it ahead. She forces the decisions. He's a great big bear of a guy. He likes to throw his arms around people. He likes to throw his arms around ideas. He likes to schmooze a lot. He likes to sort of, you know, wrestle around with things. He doesn't particularly like to make hard decisions. She likes to get right down to it. Let's move. Let's do this. Let's do that. She's much more linear. He's, he's much more postmodern. I think she's modern. The story is told about uh, a friend of mine actually went in to get uh, for a job interview and was called into the Oval Office with this new, this new team, found both the Clintons in the Oval Office, true story. And uh, Bill Clinton grabbed this guy and said, here, I want to show you the painting up here on the wall and look at this, look at this the, the chair over here, it comes in pre-revolutionary times and boy, look at this desk and look at this view, it's wonderful. And she finally walked over to the guy and said, why don't you and I just go over here on the couch and sit down and talk about the job. <clears throat> Sat down for five minutes and he got the job. Now, a lot of people think that she ought to take a cabinet post, that she ought to be a formal member of the administration. My argument to that is, why should she take the demotion? <laughs> you know, that seems to be a little silly. You know, she's running three or four cabinet jobs right, departments right now. She is basically running, in my judgment, the HHS department. I mean, she's making most of the hard calls. She's running education. She's making a lot of decisions about justice. She's got an awful lot of responsibility now. And I admire her for that. Uh, she's up on a very high wire. And, it, and she may fall down. She may get hurt in this. And he may get hurt in the process, too. But I have to tell you, I, I think she's gutsy to get up there. And uh, it, it may have a payoff. If she succeeds in this before it's over, I will tell you, I think she could open the door to the first woman president in this country. I think a lot of, a lot of folks are going to say if she does well at this, you know, we've had a woman in there making a good number of the decisions already. Why don't we go full time? It's the kind of argument I think may have some appeal in future days. After all, Britain has already had a prime minister. It was uh, tough, by my lights, a terrific prime minister. Uh, some of you probably disagree with that. I, I am a great admirer of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, Canada may soon have a, a, a woman as a prime minister. I think the day is not far off. If Hillary Clinton's in there making decisions and succeeding, when America will have a woman president, and then, frankly, the earlier the better, from my perspective. So I would argue that, uh, that so far, I think she's been an asset for him. And I think they make a good team. Now, there's an awful lot of gossip in Washington, a lot of titillation about what's going on within the relationship. And frankly, I don't think it matters very much what goes on with the relationship. And I think it's their private affair. I think what matters is they make a good partnership in terms of their public performance. And I think that there is a great deal of respect between them in terms of what they're trying to accomplish. And for that, I think they deserve, uh, the, you know, we ought to just move on. We ought to be talking more about policy than about the, about the gossip that goes on between them. Now, where are they going? That is a much, much harder question to answer. What is this all leading to? I think that there has been a lack of clarity about what the central thrust of this administration is going to be. I don't think that they've quite made up their minds. There doesn't seem to be a philosophical framework that is guiding a great deal of this. Rather, every decision is up for grabs. We know about change, but we don't know about change for what? Change in what direction? And one has the sense frequently that they wake up every day trying to figure that out. And that we're going to be a while trying to sort these questions out so we all know where they're going. Because I, I frankly don't think they quite know yet. This is very different from say a Reagan administration, which was much more ideological, but also had a very much clearer sense and firmer sense of direction. You could disagree with that direction, you could disagree with the ideology. 
but you knew what there was to disagree with. Here, it's much, much less clear, and I think there's nowhere more obvious than on health care. Every day we get, a new, we get a new trial balloon, every day it gets adjusted a little bit this way, maybe we're going to do this, maybe we're going to do that, maybe we don't know, which I think is more likely. So in terms of talking about direction, I think that's very difficult right now. I think it will be defined over time. What I do think we can talk about are some of the main characteristics or the hallmarks of the administration. And there are three I'd like to talk about tonight, things that I see happening there. Uh, the first two I'm going to talk rather briefly about. The, the last I'd like to spend a little more time with, if I might. The first is about the politics of it. I think that one has to understand this is an extraordinarily political administration, more political than most. They think politics a lot, and politics inform almost every decision. This is a team that does have its eye on 96, and more than that, it has its eye on the long-term future. They are very, very dedicated to the proposition of building a new majority party in the country. They would like to see the Democrats in charge for a good number of years to come. I don't disagree with that. I think that's politics. I think that's good politics. I think that's the way a leader ought to think. I think they're quite concerned about putting changes in place and preserving them over time so that you just don't act, enact something this year and five years later or four years later or nine years later have it reversed. More power to them. That's the way the game should be played. That's what the Republicans set out to do in 1980. Reagan wanted to build a permanent Repu or a long-standing Rep Republican majority. He didn't get there. Clinton would now like to build a long-standing Democratic majority. He, like a lot of other presidents, the strong presidents, the best presidents, would like to see his face on Mount Rushmore. Fine. It's good to have someone with ambition in that office. We shouldn't tear that down, but we should recognize it for what it is. Politics informs a lot of it, and it forms a backdrop to, to what's going on far more than I think sometimes appears in the daily headlines. This is a politics that's based on populism. It's a politics that says we can build a new party from the grassroots up by, by building particularly with a lower income. And to the degree we can, if we can pick off the middle income, especially the working people. That is where they want to go. And they're willing to do a lot of things to help those people. And basically, if you look at their economic plan, I would argue in the budget plan, basically what this plan is all about, it's to take the lower income people in the country and hold them harmless on the tax side, while on the spending side, to invest a lot of money on programs that are going to help the lower income people. That's fine. You, know, you can agree or disagree, but let's understand what's happening here. Those are going to become your classic Democratic voters, motor voter registration, and other kind of ways to get them to the polls, to get them voting. Smart politics. You take your middle class and you nick them on the tax side to the extent you have to, and you try to build in some programs that are going to help the middle class. National service for kids are sending your kids, folks are sending your kids to college. Get the interest rates down. A lot of people in this country, the middle class, are now refinancing their homes. And one of the best things that's come out of the Clinton economic program so far has been the drop in long-term interest rates. And that is very stimulative in itself. Every basis point, the long-term interest rates drop. That's 30-year treasuries. Every basis point they drop is concerned. Alan Greenspan thinks that's worth a billion dollars in stimulus. They've dropped about 90 basis points since Clinton was elected. That's worth $90 billion in stimulus right there. Do that for the middle class. Now who's going to pay for these programs? Where is, the, where is the, where the burden largely going to fall? Well, guess which group didn't vote for Bill Clinton in the last election? Every income group below $75,000 supported Clinton in the last election. The group he lost was over $75,000. Guess who's going to pay? The people over $75,000 are going to pay. Now, and there, and there are a lot of them unhappy. I hear, I've been hearing tales over the last uh, uh, 24 hours about the folks out on the golf course and how unhappy they are. Well, those are people who are not going to vote for Bill Clinton, and they're paying. That's the way politics is. It's not very, you know, the Democrats thought that Reagan was doing that the other way around, that he was Robin Hood in reverse, that he was squeezing the programs for the lower income, the WIC program and that sort of thing while he was giving a lot of benefits to his rich friends to keep them in the Republican Party. So this is, this is fairly standard politics, but understand it for what it is, because it also is going to inform the health care plan. People who don't vote Demo Democratic very often are doctors. People who run hospitals, hospital administrators. That group of people does not often vote Democratic. They often vote Republican. And guess who's going to get squeezed on the health care plan? 
You know, this is this is the way the game is often played. These people t tend to play it tougher. They're very disciplined about it, and they're and they're very purposeful about where they are going, and they understand it. Now, I happen to think that it's a dangerous form of politics. It can be very divisive. It can be very partisan. It can be a lot of class baiting in this sort of politics. One of the reasons I think his stimulus program is in trouble right now was instead of forming a coalition with some moderate Republicans, he said he thought he could run over the Republicans with his Democratic majority. You know, that little thing called arrogance that was in the office, I think they must have bottled it when Bush left because some of the Clinton people have been nipping away at it here in the last few weeks. And I think it's hurt them. But it is a purposeful form of politics. Now, there are two other elements of this politics that are important to understand. One's a geographic element, and one's, one is the uh, uh, demographic. The geographic is the West. They are very intent politically on bringing the West into the Democratic column. California has been a, a standard Republican state since 1964. Last time the Republicans lost it, but prior to Clinton was back in 1964. It's been good Republican territory. The Clintonites are intent upon breaking California, Oregon, and Washington away from the Republicans and moving over to the Democratic column. If you take those three states, that's what they represent 72 electoral votes. It only takes 270 to win in the Electoral College. If you take those out of the Republican column, move them into the Democratic column, what you wind up with is a, is a tilt toward the Democrats in future elections. We've always had a tilt toward Republicans in our recent election, past elections since the mid-60s. If you start tilting this toward the Democrats, it gives the Democrats a big advantage going into future elections. Very, very important. The other thing, the demographic change is that the Clintonites are being, and they're being very smart about this, the Clintonites are making big inroads with women, especially working women, and most especially college-educated working women. The higher you go on the income and educational scale with, with, with working women, the more democratic you find folk, people. But women are, are an incredibly important new force in American politics, and it's mostly a force that's tilting toward the Democrats, especially on the national level. In this last election, everybody talked about a turnout, increased turnout by voters. The increase among men was only about 2 or 3%. Among women, it was over 10%. In the last election, the overall voting pattern, 46% of the people who voted in this last election were men, 54% were women. It's the biggest gap we've ever had in, in presidential voting on gender. And working women went very strongly for Clinton. So that you can see where Hillary now fits into that equation. She becomes a magnet for that. I find working women, especially college-educated women, want Hillary to succeed. They see, they see her as, a, as, as someone of similar nature who's having to juggle these incredibly difficult responsibilities in life at home, with a husband, successful husband, as well as her own career. It's an awful lot, of course. It's, it's, a lot of women are going through uh, extremely difficult choices. And I will tell you this, the, the Democrats so far are making much more sense to working women than our Republicans. And I tell my Republican friends, if you want to make the Republican Party a majority ever again in your lifetime, you must respond to the needs of women in ways that you have not so far. You must understand them, you must respond to their, but not only their, 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 their needs at work, their needs to care for their young children, parental leave, that sort of thing, that you've got to be responsive to that, you've got to enlarge their set, set of choices, you have to understand their aspirations, and you have to welcome them into the Republican Party, because the Democratic Party is going to take them away from you, and they're doing that now. And I think that may be the heart of what the Clinton coalition becomes increasingly. He is losing votes in the South right now. He's, he is, he's deterior, his position has deteriorated a good deal in the Southeast in the last few months. In fact, his overall ratings are not very good at all. His overall ratings right now, at the end, near, as he comes toward the end of the first 100 days, a, recent, a couple of recent surveys have come out and said he's at the lowest level of approval ratings of any, new, of any modern president since polling began. He's below 50% now, and his disapprovals are going up in a way which has to cause concern in the White House. But I would argue that that's a snapshot that what we've seen in this presidency so far has been a roller coaster. He started by going down in the early weeks. He then came back up with that, with that, uh, that uh, strong speech to the, uh, in the State of the Union, and he's been going down. He's been trailing down again. This is a president with a lot of resources, a lot of resourcefulness, and I think, the, I think that snapshot is not necessarily telling. What I would say is watch the West, watch women, and watch the populism. First hallmark. Now, the second hallmark, 
and I'll spend less time on this, I hope. The second hallmark, I would argue, about this administration is that Bill Clinton thinks that he has seen a new wave in history, that the cycle, the pendulum of history is swinging again, and he wants to swing with it. If you read your Arthur Schlesinger Jr., you know how much Schlesinger stresses the cycles in American political history as the pendulum has moved from periods of activism over to periods of what he calls quiescence. And you see that right through the 20th century. 20th century beginning with a period of progressivism, of course, with Teddy Roosevelt stretching all the way through Woodrow Wilson. We went through the 20s with Harley, Harding, and Coolidge, quite different, much more, much more conservative period, the quiescent period. We had a lot of economic growth, but then we had a blow off, led back into the 30s and 40s with, with uh, Roosevelt and Truman, then back into the 50s with Ike, in the 60s again back into, into uh, activism, and then of course we've been in a much more conservative period until very recently. And now Bill Clinton sees that pendulum swinging back this way and he wants to give it a big shove. And what he sees is a new period when the government can take a much more active role and trying to solve society's ills. And what you find among the Clintonites is a deep-seated belief that the private marketplace has failed, that it cannot be a, a reliable source for social justice, for, for equity, and indeed for jobs, and that the government has to step in and take a much more active role in guiding the private marketplace. And, and in fact, among many Clintonites, you find a view that the government is a better judge of what's necessary and appropriate in the private marketplace than is the marketplace itself. And the view that Washington can make better decisions, and if you in the private sector don't particularly like it, either you ought to get on the team or you may get punished or we may run over you. Now, I happen to disagree with that. I do not think that that's where the true source of growth comes, but I think we ought to recognize it for what it is and understand where it's going. You see it in all sorts of facets of governmental, new governmental policy. You see it on trade, the thrust toward managed trade. The Japanese Prime Minister Miyazawa was in the Oval Office uh, on Friday. And you saw the Times headline perhaps on Saturday that there, the, two, the two sides were scolding each other over trade. And Miyazawa was disagreeing because Bill Clinton very much wants to go toward a managed trade, and that is we negotiate what our share of the Japanese market is. We have, a, we have an agreement, for example, on semiconductors right now. The Japanese agreed to essentially open up 20% of their market to our American-made semiconductors. And they've almost made that figure. It's, it, it's really increased our share of that market. Well, the Clintonites are looking at that as a model. The Japanese think that's anything but a model. That's not the way they want to play the game. And the Clintonites are playing pretty hardball on this. They're going to play hardball with the Europeans, and they're going to try to strike negotiations that are in effect say, here's how the market ought to be divided up, here's how much you ought to buy from us. That's what this quote, quote managed trade is all about. You see the same kind of activism with regard to Boeing. To move into the aircraft industry, it's been a great strength in this country, and to, and to fight on Boeing's behalf, but also to give them some, some benefits to try to help them straighten out so they can stay ahead of Airbus and Europe. You, say, you see the same sort of thing going on with, uh, with the big three, the automobile makers. A lot of governmental negotiation right now about the future of the automobile. You see it as well in high tech. The president's gotten together with, uh, with Scully and others out in Silicon Valley to talk about much more government investment, having the government help make the decision so that America, America's critical high tech industries uh, survive and prosper. And you see it especially in health care especially in health care. The only thing we've seen is, so far about health care, all these trial balloons going up, the one clear thrust has been the degree to which the administration has villainized some elements of the health care industry, starting with the pharmaceutical companies. You know, they have been, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, in my judgment, has made mistakes. They have raised their prices, in many cases, far more than is justified. They also happen to be an industry which is one of the best in the world. It has been a great source of revenue for us on exports. They're one of the most, they, they are the single most innovative industry in the world in terms of, of, of drug, new drugs coming on the market. They have a lot of strength. They have run good company. Merck, a company run by a fellow named Roy Vagelos in, in New Jersey, has been frequently judged the best run corporation in America. He opened his plant door to Bill Clinton during the campaign to come in and make a campaign speech when the, when the election was over, he was villainized. He was hung out to dry. A lot of false claims were made about him by, by the government. He had to take out advertising to try to explain his position. He happens to be right. 
But the pharmaceutical companies have been hung out to dry because they are the new along with the insurance companies and with the for-profit hospitals and with the doctors are going to be treated as the people have all done us in on health care. That happens to pander to prejudice in the country. There are a lot of people in this country who think the problem with health care in this country today is greed. There is too much greed in the health care system. There is too much inefficiency. No question about it. But every serious study that's been made on it. You go across the river here and talk to Bob Blendon at Harvard, who runs a public health center over there, public health studies, and he'll tell you there is a huge disconnect between what the public thinks is wrong in health care with its greed and avarice, and if, you, and if you talk to the experts who say, yes, it's part of that, but there's a lot of other things. It's technology, it's third-party payment system. There are a lot of other things. But the administration is playing the populist theme and going after these companies, and eventually it's going to go in and regulate them. What's coming out so far, the tilt seems to be to move away from something called managed competition and to move toward regulated, managed regulation. That's where they seem to be coming out in health care, and I'd be delighted to talk more about that when we have a chance to talk back and forth. If you want to talk through health care as a subject, I'm getting... Uh, much more interested in. I think it's, it's something we all need to be thinking about a lot more. But I would argue, with due respect, and I understand why the, the administration feels the, the, uh, the private sector has not done all that it might, especially on social equity. I understand that thrust. But I would argue that to begin to smother the private sector with a lot of new taxes, a lot of regulations, a lot of new directives out of Washington, is in fact going to smother the only job producing machine we have. And it's been very, very successful in the past. What we need to do is repair it, restore it, encourage it, not to smother it. And you will find as you go around American industry today an awful lot of fear that we're moving in the wrong direction. If you look at something like the uh, biotech industry, the biotech industry has been decimated by these attacks that have come. The stocks in the biotech industry have fallen over 40 percent since the election. That is, a, that is a, an industry that depends upon new capital. It's a lifeblood of an, that industry. And once you start drying it up and their stocks fall, you can wipe out an industry that was one of the world's leaders and is very, very hopeful sign for us in the future. So I have a lot of problems with this. The very moment the rest of the world is moving toward a much more uh, muscular and uh, entrepreneurial approach when the East Asians are growing like crazy because they've embraced entrepreneurialism, but when, the, when the, you look into southern China and see the provinces there and how they're changing, especially just across in Guangdong, across from Hong Kong, and you see the kind of growth that's occurring there, the rest of the world is growing because it's embracing free markets. And for us to move away from free markets, in my judgment, is a mistake. And I think we'll pay dearly from it for it if we go too far. That's the second hallmark. Now, the third hallmark, and one I happen to uh, feel much more positively about. And here I think that Bill Clinton, in fact, can make his greatest contribution, is in the question of investing in human capital. And on this one, I think they're on the right track. I just wish they'd move faster. On, on, on the interference on the, on the business side, I think they're moving too rapidly. They're going too deep on the intervention. But on the human capital side, I think the country needs to far, do far more. This is an area, I must confess to you, that I think in the Reagan days, I was there. I think we invested too little in. I think we neglected it too much. I think the Bush administration neglected it too much. And I think it's time we all woke up to, the, to, to what we're now facing. I think it was one of the greatest mistakes of the Reagan and Bush years. We did not invest more in human capital and didn't, didn't do more for it. We talked about education. We got some things done. We didn't go far enough the time I was in the Reagan administration. And since then, in watching as an outside observer on this, I must tell you, I think too little has been done. But this human capital question, in my judgment, is central to America's future. And indeed, I think a lot of uh, what happened in the Clinton administration, the most important contribution may well come from Bob, Bob Reich going there in the Labor Department. I think what he is attempting to do, what he has written about, what he's talked about, I think is dead on. And what my fear is we're going to do too little. We're not going to do it. We're, we're going to underfund it. What's the proposition here? The general proposition is that we're, as we move into this new world economy, the approach that America has taken over the last 50 to 75 years has worked extremely well for us, but it's now become obsolete. It was an approach that was fathered by somebody named Taylor. He was, signed, he was in scientific management. It was the whole notion of mass uh, assembly lines and mass education. 
It was a good notion for its time. It came during the Industrial Revolution. It was an attempt to produce far greater volume of goods than we had in the past, and it worked. It didn't provide, uh, provide much variety, but it worked in terms of helping people's standard of living. Henry Ford said in the early days, and he said, you know, people in this country can buy any color automobile that they want, so long as it's black. There wasn't much variety. But during that Industrial Revolution, as you will recall, there were many people who thought that two different classes, two different nations were arising in industrial societies. If you go back and read your Disraeli, someone like that, you hear those descriptions about how people are separating out. Marx thought, of course, that the proletariat would eventually rise up and strike down the ruling class. What saved us was very much the fact that we were able to move into mass production, that people at the, at, and, and those poor who lived in poverty were able to get jobs in which they made things, they moved into factories, and eventually we created a, a middle class. It was a huge increase in living standards in this country and occurred elsewhere as a result of mass production. It created the biggest middle class, best middle class we ever had. And it, and it worked magically after the Second World War. We doubled the national income after the Second World War in 25 years. We did extremely well with it. Mass education, mass production worked. But the theory of mass production was that you could train in our high schools, you could, if you could train people to take orders, to take directions, all you had to do was teach them good attitude to show up on time and be willing to take directions. Then we would train a different group of people at the top to give directions and tell them what to do. There'd be a thin layer on top would be the managers, and the masses would be the workers. And they'd take directions, and all you had to do was get them through high school and shove them on in, and it'd be fine. And it worked. But it does not work in the new economy, in the new global economy. And the reason it doesn't work is we can no longer pay those people with low skills. We can no longer pay them high wages. Those manufacturing jobs, as you know here in Massachusetts, are disappearing at an incredible rate. And if you talk to a Lester Thoreau, I sometimes disagree with him, but he makes the argument, I think it's persuasive, that the job loss we have seen so far may be a trickle compared to what's coming, to the flood that may be coming. You can't go to Mexico anymore and, and see what's happening on those assembly lines and recognize that they are as skilled as we are. They're low skilled, we're low skilled, and they take jobs for $2 an hour. You can, you're not gonna pay people $14 an hour here. If you want to find out what's happening in Los Angeles, why don't Los Angeles spend so much on the knife, knife edge, go out and talk to Peter Uberoth. And what he'll tell you is, they used to have $20 an hour jobs in Los Angeles, and they've disappeared. They've been replaced by $8 an hour jobs at best. You walk through South Central Los Angeles right now, I, I spent some time out there recently. You walk through South Central Los, Los Angeles, and it's been totally deindustrialized. It looks like Eastern Europe. It's an unbelievable sight. All those companies that have left, all those jobs that have disappeared. People say black men don't want to work. Let me tell you something. For a long, long time in this country, black men had a higher rate of participation in the labor force than white men did for many, many years. That was traditionally true right through the Second World War. Black men did work, and they worked in South Central Los Angeles. They had good jobs, and the jobs disappeared. Black women worked. Black women worked more than white women did until about 10 years ago. The jobs disappeared on these folks, and then the culture started collapsing. And what you're finding is, in place after place, that people with low skills are losing money. What happened over the 80s was not just a matter of, of the tax structure. What happened in the 80s here in this country happened in other industrialized countries, and that is the people who had educations saw their incomes continue to go up. If you take the top quarter of people in this country in the 1980s, over the last 20 years, in fact, their incomes have continued to go up. It's the bottom two-thirds who do not have college educations, who are not skilled, who are finding their incomes dropping down and down and down. And what it's opening up again is this same two-class structure that we saw back in the times of, time of Disraeli. We got the top group going like this and the bottom group going like that, and we've got, we're opening up a huge class cleavage in this country. And because a disproportionate number of people in this lower group are minorities, race and class are becoming very explosive issues once again in our society. Very, very divisive. I think the toughest challenge we face over the next 20 years is to, is to improve the lot of this group here and to bring more cohesiveness in this society because I will tell you we are separating out at an incredible rate. I was, re I was recently in, uh, 
in Atlanta. I was there last week and went through a community in just in North Atlanta, which is, uh, I keep on forgetting, the, the Buckhead. I know you've all been to Buckhead. Buckhead is just, she was shaking her hand, head yes. Well, it's, it's really interesting to go through. It's fairly new development. And you see these condos that are all pushed up close together. The condos sell for two to $300,000 a piece. Two to $300,000 a piece. Some are really expensive. Elton John has a condo in Buckhead. They're beautiful. They have lakes, they have little splashy ponds, you have swans around, they have you know, the trees, or, you know, the birds in the trees. It, it's, they're wonderful. And around every one of those condo complexes are very thick iron fences. Very thick, very pointed, very difficult to penetrate. And inside every one of those iron fences are security forces that are unbelievable. Those security forces in Buckhead have much better equipment than do the Atlanta public police. Security forces in Buckhead have night goggles so they can see infrared and they can see people going through. The Atlanta police don't anything like that. They have much, much better equipment. We have more people working in private security forces in this country today than we have working in public police forces. Because that's because all the people this, this upper group are buying security, they're buying safety. They feel they have to invest in it. And we're losing that sense of community and cohesiveness and it's becoming very, very explosive. And it extends to something so basic as access to information. There was a very interesting story that just came out in the Washington Post about 10 days ago about Bridgeport, Connecticut, largest town in Connecticut. In downtown Bridgeport, the libraries in downtown Bridgeport, you know, they, you know, there's a question whether you keep them open on Saturdays, you keep them open on Sundays. In downtown Bridgeport, the question is what day each week you want to keep the library open. It's only open one day a week. There is no general interest bookstore in downtown Bridgeport, the largest city in Connecticut. All of the surrounding suburbs have the libraries open seven days a week. You go back 20 years ago, Gallup has done surveys on reading habits. 20 years ago, 30% of the people said they were reading a book over the past 24 hours, some kind of book. 30% of the college educated, 20% of the non-college educated said they were reading a book. Pretty small gap. 30% of the college educated, 20% of the non-college educated. Last year they took the same poll. College educated, the number of people who have read a book in the past 24 hours have been reading a book in the past 24 hours has gone up. It was nearly 40%. The number of non-college educated who are reading books has been cut in half. It's down to 10%. That gap had widened. Information, people with knowledge. People with, at the, who are not getting these degrees at the lower level are not getting knowledge and they cannot survive in this new world where knowledge becomes so critical. Not the capacity to take directions, is the capacity to adapt, to be innovative, to form a team, to be in a high performance workplace, to make new products, to form an assembly line, to take six people, men and women, put them together and turn out a whole car yourself, not just putting out a little piece in the car every time it passes by. That's what other nations are doing. That's the way they're training themselves. I just came back from Germany a couple of weeks ago and went over and looked at their apprenticeship training program. We all talk about that. And I wanted to see it. And I was, it, was, it was a knockout. I'm telling you what they are doing with their non-college bound with kids who are not going to college is very striking. It's something far more impressive than anything we've got here. They take kids, most of their kids don't go on to university either, but they take them and put them in apprenticeship programs that last about three years. And they're very intensive. I went to a company called Sharing. It's a drug company, drug, uh, it's a pharmaceutical company there. And they, one of the best buildings they have on the, on the plant, in, in two or three blocks where this plant covered, one of the best buildings they have is their education building. It's a building specially built for young apprentices to come there. They have classrooms, they have demonstration areas, they have replicas of everything that's on the plant, and kids spend three years there. I went and talked to people in the biology class and chemistry class. They're training to be biology assistants and chemistry assistants. Three years of training. They get paid a, a, a small wage so they can live decently, the kids who go there. Plus they get the That company spends on each kid they spend $100,000 per kid over three years, $100,000. The kid has no obligation to stay at sharing when it's over. You get a degree from the state, but you're apprenticed to be a chemical assistant or a biological assistant, and you can take that anywhere in Germany and get a job, and you get good wages for that. And that's happening. That's the kind of system they run. Deutsche Bank training clerks the same way, but to be in the, in the bank. You go into a teller here in the bank in the States, 
and you, you walk up to the teller, you know, they can maybe add, they can maybe subtract, but after you make your deposit and make your withdrawal, because that's all you can do there at the window, you check your numbers real closely to make sure that they've been added up properly. That's what we get. Deutsche Bank, they take them, they train them for three years. And the people who come out of that, young men, young women, can do the deposits, can do the withdrawals, they can negotiate a mortgage at the window, they can negotiate a loan, and they can sell you stock, and they can give you stock tips. They can help manage your account for small savers. That's what they're training them to do, and those people command good wages, and they can work their way up through the system. The CEO of the Deutsche Bank today is not a graduate of the university in Germany, he's a graduate of the apprenticeship program of the Deutsche Bank. That's the kind of openness. They, have, they spend five to six percent of payroll on training. We don't do anything like that. But typically in this country, the companies that spend money on training do it for the top management. They don't do it for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, that, for that second group. We don't give those kind of people much training. And what's got to be done is to train those people. We can do it. I would argue that what we have done in the military over the last 25 years, the last 15 years in particular, proves that you can take college-educated kids and, and train them good skills, and they can come out and, be, and do a lot of things. They are terrific products that come out of that system. And it also proves if you give people, they don't care what the color of their skin is, what their gender is, they can be black, brown, yellow, green. If you give them equal access to education, and then you give them equal opportunity to get over the same bar and set the bar at the same place for everybody, everybody makes it over about the same way. It does not make any difference what the background is. If you give them equal access to education, which obviously we're not doing. That's why we've got to take these kids, and that's why I think Clinton has been on the right track of saying, we have got to give skills to our young people. This, to me, is the heart of what Bill Clinton can make a contribution to this country about. If we can give people skills, they can then command higher wages. We can have some prospect of getting more jobs here and having a decent society. If, we, if we're going to let those people drift down and down, it, we're going to be in an explosive situation for the rest of our lives. We're going to be in more Los Angeles. We're going to be sitting on the edge of our chair waiting for more Rodney King trial verdicts. As we sat through yesterday, I thought, frankly thought it was silly that we were all, you know, so strange to go in and watch CNN yesterday and to be sitting on the edge of your chair thinking this is the difference, this is where the line is between order and chaos. When the line ought to be have a lot more to do with social justice and what the way people are living every day rather than on the verdict of this one court. I thought that was like, unbelievable. <clears throat> so is that issue that I, where I think Clinton is right on, but I'm worried that he's not making, an, he's not pushing hard enough on it. If you go in and talk to people in the administration, they say, God, we really believe in this, but we haven't got any money. And by the way, we gotta, we're gonna put some money into it, but we gotta go out and for, fund all this pork barrel stuff to go in order to get the votes. We gotta put money into the, the manned space station. Manned space station is gonna cost $130 billion. We could do the same thing scientifically for one quarter of it if we took the people out of it. It made it, it made it a more of a mechanistic operation. But people have got to, we got the, the Clinton administration feels it's got to do that in order to please the Congress, in order to get the votes, in order to pass the program. Well, here's where I come back to it. I, th I think the critical thing is if the president can come to us and explain what he is trying to do on this investment in human resources and really push it, I think he can force the Republicans into supporting it. I think a lot of the Democrats will go along with it. And I think in the end, that contribution alone would make a very strong presidency. Thanks very much for your attention. <clears throat> pretty well without Mark Shields, David. <laughs> there are microphones at the front of the hall. Just to caution everybody, there's only one speech maker tonight. That's, you just heard it. But there's plenty of room for questions. Please. Um, yeah, you spoke of managed regulation with regards to health care, and I wanted your thoughts on that. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Word. Managed regulation in regards to health care reform? Well, the issue is uh, uh, ma managed regulation, in effect, would have I wish you asked that question. I'm sorry I didn't get to you about 8 o'clock. 
because it's really unfair to people to let them stay on. I, the the managed regulation, in effect, is a is a system or, or an approach to healthcare which says that if you leave it up to the private sector you're going to continue to have huge inflation, that prices are going to skyrocket upwards, that we're not going to be able to save the money we need to, and it's going to make it even more expensive to pay for access for the 37 million people who have no insurance in this country today and who need and deserve access to health care. Uh, there are many people who believe that if you leave it up to the private sector, it won't work. Those advocates are saying the best thing to do is to go to something which is much closer to price controls, what you might call managed regulation of health care. And that is that the government set limits, as it does in Medicare and in Medicaid, to how much is paid to hospitals and essentially to doctors for various procedures. And it would involve some rationing. Now, Medicare and Medicaid has worked in part, although it hasn't fully worked, because what's happened to hospitals when they've got these price controls put on them and they've had their reductions in prices is that many hospitals have taken, taken a hit over Medicare by, by increasing their prices for the private side. It's called cost shifting. Under this new system, when if, you, if you regulate everything, there's no cost shifting that's available. So what you're going to find is you're going to put a squeeze on the hospitals, and they're going to have several. You know, then they're going to have some choices, and they're not very pleasant choices. You can start rationing care, or you can start holding, or you can start denying care to people, uh, or you're going to have long lines, or you're just you're going to find that the system will not work as well. Now, I will just say this: price controls are very popular when people first hear about them. I happened to be in the Nixon White House in 1971, August of 71, when he imposed wage and price controls across the economy. They were very popular at the time. They helped him to get reelected in 1972. In retrospect, they were the, probably the worst mistake of his presidency. Some people believe his worst mistake was not burning the tapes. But, the, but, but wage and price controls were probably the worst mistake because they did not work. They were a mess. By 1973, we were trying to take them off, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the top blew off the economy. And, and we had bad inflation during the 1970s, in part because of that decision to go to wage and price control. Every time people have experimented with wage and price controls, they do not seem to work. I mean, you, you'll hear the cliche that we, they've been tried for 3,000 years and they haven't worked. My own judgment is we ought to try and manage competition long before we try wage and price controls, and let's see if it will work. There is some evidence that it will. But thank you.